one of the things I want to dive into that, that you've mentioned a couple of times is the bookend of your evening and why that last 30 minutes is so important. People often talk about the morning routine at depth, obviously, as we are. Um, but now you're, you're, you're diving into different territory. Let's talk about in depth that evening routine and why that is additionally so important to success in your day. I feel like it's the missing link that so many people overlook. There are so many people out there that struggle with quality sleep, getting to bed, actually falling to sleep. They'll go to sleep at, let's say, 10 o'clock. They toss and turn. They're on their phone. They're doing things that don't set them up for a quality night's sleep. And then they wonder why when they wake up, they're exhausted, stressed, and, and felt like they haven't slept at all. So sleep is so incredibly powerful, right? It heals our body. It heals our minds. So preparing yourself for a good night's sleep is Hey, I am going to get a good night's sleep. I am preparing for it. For example, for me, I put on blue light blockers or go take out my contacts and my glasses actually have blue light blockers in them. So I'm not getting any of that light from outside sources. It starts the production of melatonin. It starts that shutdown process. Typically, I'm reading before bed, so I'm not looking at a screen. I'm not being overly stimulated by it. And it allows me to prepare for a good night's sleep. So what happens? I fall asleep very, very quickly. What much to my wife's dismay when we'll be having a conversation sometimes and I'll be out in like six seconds. She's like, how did you fall asleep when I was actually talking to you? You know, preparing for a good night's sleep as well as feeding your mind with something positive, something amazing you did, right? So many times we think about, oh crap, what did I not do? Or I didn't get this done. We beat ourselves up, right? We're the only species on the planet that continues to beat ourselves over and over for the things we didn't do. But celebrating a success, marinating on that, thinking about it, and then visualizing your success in the next day, the mind actually works through it as you're sleeping. So imagine how powerful you end your day thinking about something amazing you did. And then what's the amazing thing you're going to tackle tomorrow? Your mind is going to be set up for that success and it's going to be open to what you're going to accomplish. Yeah, I, I love that. And I spend my I spend my evening as I'm like falling asleep, like laying in bed, focused on things that feel so unbelievably unattainable that when I wake up in the morning, like I'm even dreaming about it because it feels so impossible, right? Because I, I try to preface like we understand that the brain can't really dictate reality from fiction and from dreams. And, and I've always thought about this. Like if I dream about doing this really crazy thing and I can convince my brain that it's possible, then maybe it is possible. And I'll, I'll tell you this, Jeff, I've done things that are almost impossible because I went to bed dreaming about them and the stuff that I'm working on in the future is even greater than that. So I'm super excited to see what happens with those things. Let me ask you this though, where, where people are in this position of looking at their life from the scope of lack, of not abundance, of not gratitude, of not having the things that they want. It's really easy. Like I've been there. I, I think you've been there. We can all admit that, right? And, and I don't ever want to stand on high and look at people and go, well, just do this because I don't think that's how life works. But what I do think is that there's always space to find some sort of gratitude in your day, find some sort of accomplishment in your day. But for the people who will say, I didn't accomplish anything. I just did what I had to do. And, and it's they're very nonchalant about their own abilities. What tool, if any, can you give them to try to tap into something incredible that they've done in their day? So a couple, couple things. One is starting that process of being grateful for something. And, and if you can't find anything, asking someone close to you, because many times people can see things that you can't right? So that might trigger that thought of, yes, I should be grateful for, for two wonderful sons, right? So if you can't get yourself started, ask somebody close to you and they'll probably be able to give you some ideas. The second piece is start that practice of writing it down, get it down, write it on paper, either in the morning, at night, you know, write it down. And then that will start to open your mind up to things that you're grateful for. And then the third piece I would recommend is getting out and going for a walk in nature. Right, getting out there, there's so much power to being out in nature. I remember it was a couple months ago going for a walk around the neighborhood, and I was I was walking, and I don't know what was going on in my world in that day, but I just saw cars and driveways, and I thought, gosh, how how grateful should all of us be in this neighborhood that we have a place, you know, a roof over our head, we have cars in our driveways. 
I mean, there are so many more people less fortunate. So why am I even thinking whatever I was thinking on that day? So, you know, th those would be the, the three strategies I'd give to start someone down that path to getting much more into a grateful mindset and getting into that mindset. It's just like building a habit, right? You need to practice it over and over again. It's that, that repeating of what you're doing and then it becomes second nature. And then all of a sudden you see more things that you're grateful for. And I love that you mentioned that and you brought that to attention because I don't think there's anything wrong with being angry. You should be, it's a human emotion. Like it's a part of this. You should be able to feel what it's like to be pissed off. Yes. But you know what? You can use that anger to build something or you can use it to burn stuff down. Yeah, it's it, for sure. I mean, anger is, is an emotion that any, and anyone can feel, right? But the power is what are you going to turn that energy into? When, when you feel that anger, are you going to let it consume you and let it bring you down and let it control you? Or are you going to say, hey, you're my right now, okay? I'm going to control you and I'm going to transfer, I'm going to transfer you into this, into momentum of building, into showing up, into proving people that I'm not going to fail, into, into using my power, not giving my power away, whatever it may be. It's how you respond to the emotion and what, because energy, you know, can't be created nor destroyed. It just gets transferred. It gets, you know, created, not created, it gets, yeah, transferred from, from thing to thing. You could, we have the power and the energy we feel, because that's what emotion is, it's energy in motion, uh, we can we can convert it, that's where I was looking for, into anything we want. Because you can't, that's just, that's that's the power that I don't think a lot of people understand. Um, is when we feel an emotion, we have the power to convert it into anything we want. And, and you and I know that we can use it for good and for power. So I, I think it's a beautiful learning lesson. Yeah, and, and you can definitely use it for evil, which I have. Um, yes. <laughs> you know, the, the majority of my 20s was evil Michael. I, in, in, my, in my first book, I wrote, uh, I, I took the evil Michael to the backyard and I shot him. Um, that, was a, that was a joke I took from the movie Twister, if you ever remember that film, just aging myself <laughs> briefly. Um, but, but there was some truth to that because I was like, man, you're destroying your life. Like my life could not have been worse. I'm, I'm making $150,000 a year, but everything's a disaster, morbidly obese, smoking two packs a day, drinking myself to sleep. Like this thing where I'm like, this anger is actually consuming me, mm -hmm. right? I didn't understand about this idea of what it means to be yourself and how you can craft yourself, how you can create yourself. And you know, I, I sit and I look at you and the conversations we have, like, this is a human that has crafted themselves. You have made you who you are. What, what has that process been like for you? Cause I think a lot of people are like, I have this idea about who I want to be, but you know, to bring it to fruition feels almost impossible. Yeah. And it does, because if you feel like you're so far from what you want to be, that, that does feel impossible. It feels like a long journey to me. It feels like I'm ever growing. It feels like power. It feels like happiness in every moment. Like you can, you can achieve anything you want by first believing it's possible. And then I don't want to say fake the funk and, and fake it until you make it because there's, 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 I can say both ways on that, but you got to have the feeling first. You got to have the feeling of what kind of person you want to be or the life you want. You have to live it now in order for it to fill in. Like you don't have to have, you can have your goal, you can have your plan and yeah, you want marks on how to get there. You do want some sort of plan, some sort of GPS, because that's really important. You want some sort of direction. And that is why I meditate every single morning. I meditate on my vision, who I want to be today, who I want to be tomorrow, who I want to be by the end of the year. And that puts me in the feeling now. And that feeling is power. It's happiness. And I've trained myself that the power really is in this moment right now. And if I can be happy right now and have that feeling that I've made everything that I've ever wanted come true, that's just going to the law is it, it just fills in. Like that's all the research I've been doing in the past, like five, six months, which is really, really beautiful. Um, but yeah, it's, it's about the feeling. It's about the power. 
you gotta you gotta own that and and have it right now um and not let go of that because that's when you feel consumed by other things like what you were just saying the anger consuming you have the happiness consume you instead i have to ask this question because i'd be remiss not to what does it mean to you to like commit first because I hear so much of that in your journey and in your experience. And I think people fail to really truly understand what happens when they make a decision and commit to their life. What does that mean to you? That's so good that you just said commit first. Like leaders go first, they commit, they lead the way. If we want commitment from others, we have to demonstrate commitment ourselves. So to me, it's about committing to the life that you want. It's the grit to say, this is my vision. This is my purpose. This is where I'm going and why I'm going there. When you know your why, you will know the way and you won't let obstacles get in the way. And we don't get burned out because of what we do. We get burned out because we forget why we do it. And so we have our vision, we have our purpose and that drives us to move us forward. We stay positive on the journey. We have a love of what we do. There's a devotion to it. There's a love and a devotion. And I always say love drives grit because if you don't love it, you'll never be great at it. But when you love something, you're not going to give up. You're not going to quit. You're going to keep on moving forward. And for me, it was a commitment that said, you know what? Let's go for it. Life is short. We have nothing to lose. Even with the restaurant, second mortgage or home, I got to give my wife a lot of credit. She said, let's go for it. Let's do it. And you commit. It's almost like what Les Brown says, right? He says, you jump and you grow your wings on the way down, right? You got to commit. And I believe God will move heaven and earth when you're on the right path to support you. And so, you do commit and it's in that commitment where you activate somehow you activate the forces, some call it the universe, others call it God, but you activate the forces and the power to start to move through your life because you're committing, you're sacrificing, you're serving, you're making a difference. So to me, it means that commitment, that trust, that faith, you're not living in fear. Fear holds so many people back. It's the faith to keep moving forward. I can look back and say everything I have in my life was because I took a step into it and said, you know what? No fear, courage, boldness, faith, and yes, a commitment. I believe you need the courage to have commitment. Like there's courage that creates the commitment that allows you to be successful. And so I do have a lot of courage and, and some, in some ways stupidity and, and almost like naive enough to be successful. Like I'd put that money down in the restaurant. It could have went south. I could have lost all this money. My partners did steal from me years later. And, and then I left and said, buy me out. I first asked to see the books. They said, we're not showing them to you. I said, well, if you don't show them to me, I'm going to send a demand letter from my attorney. So you have to show them. After that, they said, okay, we're buying you out. Again, I'm 28, 29 years old. Don't know a whole lot about business, but they agreed to buy me out. They offered me $100,000. It was probably worth four to 500,000, but I took the money. I said, fine, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to go to court. I'm not going to waste my energy on that. I'm taking the money and I'm moving forward. And I did. I think so often we get caught up in the past. We allow that energy of the past and the fighting and the bitterness to hold us back. I said, no, I'm moving forward. And that's what I did. Took that hundred thousand, moved down. You know, we moved down to Florida. That's what I used to open up the Moe's plus second mortgage in my home and $20,000 in credit cards, right? It's about 220,000 total to open up that place. And next thing you know, I turned that two, you know, that 220. When I sold my restaurants, I sold them for about a million dollars. You know, I had to pay, so, pay back some of my investors because we opened up several others, but took that money and then said, okay, I'm now going to write and speak. And now that I can see is the foundation for everything I've been doing and have done. So it was all about commitment, jumping in with the restaurant, jumping in with the most, jumping in as a writer and speaker and saying, I don't know what the future holds, but I know this is my mission. This is my calling. And I did say, I'm going to go for this. I realize this is what I'm meant to do. Even if it takes me 10 to 15 years, I'll be 40. I'll be 45. Even if it takes me that long, at least I'm doing what I love and I'm passionate about it. And I love getting up every day doing this work because doing the other work where I was working for someone. I felt like my soul was dying every day. I felt like I was literally, instead of living, I was dying. And I knew I was made for more. I knew I was made to serve others and make a difference. And clearly this was the calling that I was meant for because I wake up every day excited about what I'm doing. Thankfully I get to do it. And, you know, I don't really don't need to go give a lot of talks every year, 
but I do. I give over 50 to 60 talks, sometimes 80 talks every year. I did 137 last year between virtual and live, 55 in person. And I still do it because this is my calling. People say, well, what are you going to do, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? What's your, what's your five-year plan, 10-year plan? To continue to do this work, to serve others, to make a difference, to write maybe more children's books, to encourage more kids, and to continue to have an impact, to get to interview people like you who are teaching about trauma and over, overcoming trauma, childhood trauma, which is so important. Again, I'm learning things along the way. I never heard of trauma until about, about a year ago, two years ago. Now I've been hearing about it all the time. So now this is something that's new for me, but it's something I realize how important it is. And it's amazing you're doing this work. And so again, I'm always curious, what's next? Where is God going to lead me? And I'm open. See, that's the thing. God doesn't pick the best, right? He picks the most willing. And you got to be willing. He doesn't pick the best, right? He picked you. He picked me. Like, you know, who are we, right? But he picked us to do this work. And we're just willing and we're obedient. I always say, pray and obey. You pray. And then when you get that word, when you get that call, and when you get the message, obey and go. A lot of people get it. They get the impulse. They get the desire. They get the, the, the thought that says you should do this. And they say, oh, no, 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 I can't do that. Oh, no, no, that, that won't work. Oh, I, I don't have what it takes to do that. Or I don't feel worthy. I don't feel worthy. I don't feel of, of value. Like who am I to be doing that? And so what happens is they retreat. Instead of stepping forward with faith and boldness and courage, they retreat. And so then God can't use them to do what he wants them to do, to be who they're meant to be. And so they never become who they're meant to become. Our job is to say, use me. I'm open, commit and say, let's go and believe that it's possible. Believe that it's possible for God because God is a lot bigger than you and believe that it's possible for you because you are worthy and you're here to do great things.